Welcome everyone and welcome to the final nuclear masterclass of this series. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the masterclass so far. I hope you enjoy this webinar series so far, depending on which route you're you're on it. Um, and I'm sure you're in for a great night tonight. So my name is Christian Diet. I'm at University of York. I'm a nuclear physics researcher in nuclear astrophysics and nuclear medicine. Uh, and I'm here um, to to lead this session, to chair this session uh, with a fantastic external speaker tonight. Uh, first, a couple of housekeeping aspects of the of the evening. Um, if you'd like subtitles on it, uh, you can get the subtitles by using the CC um, button at the uh, on your screen. And if you have any Wi-Fi issues, you can always rejoin the webinar uh, again using the same link you've already used. Lastly, the webinar is also being recorded, so um, uh, I would, of course, encourage you to to revisit that again uh, later on. It will be shared with all of you uh, on the Nuclear Masterclass webpage next week. Uh, so for this uh, evening's event, we'll be exploring how nuclear physics research and nuclear physics can be used in uh, nuclear medicine. And our speaker tonight is Professor Thomas Elias Kokolius. Uh, so welcome, Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Christian. Hi, Hi. It's, it's good to see you. Um, so uh, just to introduce Thomas, Thomas is a, an associate professor at Kau Leuven in Belgium, uh, working in radiation physics, in nuclear physics, both fundamental nuclear physics and applied nuclear physics in particular in applications related to nuclear medicine, um, new treatments, new diagnostics. Um, I'll leave that to you, Thomas, to, to describe all of that um, tonight. Uh, I'm certainly excited to hearing from you, uh, and I hope all of our participants are equally excited. Um, throughout the session, one thing that I had wanted to, to mention was uh, Thomas is very happy to answer questions at the end of, of the session, and I will be putting your questions to Thomas. And therefore, please do use the Q&A button uh, on your screens. All of those questions will go to me, and I will try to put as many of those as we possibly can uh, to Thomas. Uh, so please do use that. Um, so with that, um, I think there's just one final uh, thing I wanted to mention about Thomas. Uh, I've known Thomas for a number of years now, uh, and one of the aspects that I've always enjoyed is uh, Thomas's knitting at conferences and webinars and everything else. Um, so uh, I thought I'd just share that little bit of, of personal experience uh, with everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for that part of you uh, as well, Thomas. Uh, so with that, over to the nuclear physics and the nuclear medicine, and I will, I will step back uh, for a moment. Uh, while we listen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Christian, for the invitation and for the introduction. And since I will be talking a lot today, I have uh, not brought my needles with me, but uh, I'm definitely always working on some crazy science projects with my knitting, that's for sure. But today, I'm going to be here to talk to you about uh, how nuclear physics can contribute to the nuclear medicine research and to more treatment uh, with nuclear medicine, especially against cancer. My name is Thomas Kokolius. Uh, as I said, I'm an associate professor now at KU Leuven in Belgium, but I was also um, in the UK for a while in Manchester. And I think this is when Christian and I also um, overlap somewhat, although he was also before me in Leuven as well. So we sort of follow each other's path every now and then. And, uh, and that's, um, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to collaborate on those events with you. So what I'm going to be talking to you about uh, today, I will first get back to some basics of nuclear medicine and uh, bring to your attention what, what it is and how radionuclides can be used in a medical setting, uh, either for imaging or for therapy, and how we do get the targeted action to combine with the nuclear capabilities. After that, I will bring some recent highlights and achievements in the field uh, that have quite revolutionized that field and uh, given it a really big boost and expansion in the last, say, decade. Finally, I will come to the core nuclear physics research that I am doing and uh, many of my colleagues are involved with 
in order to improve the possibilities of that field and maybe bring out the therapies of tomorrow. So let's start with the basics of nuclear medicine. It starts first with the imaging, and we call that molecular imaging. The idea is that you transport a radionuclide, so a radioactive substance, to a specific location in the body. Typically, you target cells or a group of cells, um, and you bring the radionuclide to that location. From that point, it decays and it can emit, emit which you've seen, different forms of radiation alpha, beta, or gamma radiation. Those will have different depths of penetrations. And for example, while an alpha particle will be immediately stopped with paper, a gamma radiation will have the tendency to penetrate, to penetrate very deeply um, through different materials. That means if it is emitted from within the body, it can actually shine outside of the body. Now, if you surround the patient, with an array of detectors, then you can detect those gamma rays and you can take pictures of where those molecules have arrived, where they have accumulated in the body. If you do it with sufficient orientation, so from multiple directions, say from here, from the top, from the other side, and so on, you can apply also complex algorithm to recreate a 3D picture of where those different molecules have landed where they have been accumulated. And that is a very powerful technique to see where different processes are happening in the body. Now, how do we get this targeted action? How do we know where something is going? Uh, we can take the picture of that, but where should it be going? And then you want to see whether you get that understanding. I've divided that for myself into three big categories. The first one is just sending a free radioactive substance in the body. Uh, the example I take here is iodine. Iodine is very well known to gather in the thyroid, you know, towards your throat. Uh, that's the place where it always accumulates. Now, if you would have, for example, a thyroid cancer that gets distributed in the body with free roaming cancer cells, then you certainly would start to see iodine flashing from everywhere in the body. And so it's very important to see um, at which stage of development, for example, if you have a sudden growth of the thyroid. It's also useful to just map the activity of the thyroid and know, for example, if someone is suffering from hyperthyroidism. Uh, so that's uh, what iodine can be used for. Another one that you might be very familiar with is calcium. Calcium goes to the bones. You might have heard your parents telling you, however many times, please drink your milk because it's full of calcium. It's good for your bones. Well, if you give radioactive calcium, it will also go to the bones. And that allows you, for example, to map where bone growth might be happening in the body. Another way to go is to take a familiar molecule like the sugar represented here with this blue hexagon and then replace one of the components on it by a radioactive substance. That way, if you inject that into the body, it will gather where that substance would naturally go. Sugar goes wherever your body is consuming and doing a lot of activity. But this one, where you replace here with a radioactive fluorine, cannot be processed by the body. So it will just accumulate. And that allows you to see where your body is taking a lot of sugar. For example, that allows you to map brain activity. Say, which part of your brain fires when you're speaking your own language with respect to when you're speaking a foreign language? Or what part of the brain is active when you play the piano or where you do a math exercise? Or it allows you to see if you have a reduction of brain activity. For example, it could be a way to see if a patient starts to suffer from dementia or Alzheimer. So all those are different activities that you can use by just having a radioactive sugar. And the final way is sort of the advanced engineering way is to devise a completely uh, new molecule that will target specific part of the body. So if you consider what a cell looks like, you have here the uh, nucleus of the cell, and then around it you have uh, the cytoplasm and the membrane. And on the surface of the membrane, you may have receptors, sort of um, 
she holds that we'll only respond to one specific molecule. And then you could engineering a matching set on the other side with just the right key to meet that keyhole. And those could be peptides or hormones or antibodies, as we presented here on the right. But when you see those, you notice how they have very different sizes. And in the body, they will behave very differently and they will move at a very different pace. Peptides will be eliminated from the body within, say, an hour, whereas an antibody can take multiple days to find its way through the body. You might have heard a lot about viruses in just common discussions in the last few years. We've all faced the COVID-19 pandemic, and we always hear that, you know, there is that delay in your body responding. That delay in your body responding is the time it takes for the antibodies to be activated and to find their way through the body. And that's a few days, sometimes even a week or two. So that's why we have to be very careful then as to which radionuclide we would attach to that, and that we make sure to have a very good match between what is the biodistribution, the time things circulate through the body, what we call the pharmacokinetics, and the half-life of the radionuclide. If you attach something very long-lived to a fast-acting peptide, well, it will all be out of the body before it can decay. However, if you attach something with a very short half-life to an antibody, you will just get a beautiful picture of the bloodstream, but not of the process you are trying to map. So that's also a very important part in those designs. Now, what is the anatomy of such uh, radiopharmaceutical? It is made of, on the one end, your targeting system, here represented by an antibody. And then you want to attach to it a radionuclide. And we do that by sort of making a chemical cage and a linker to attach it uh, to our targeting system. And we call that a chelator. And so then it's always a question of what you are trying to target in the body with this acting molecules on one side, and then on the other, which chemical system you're going to use and which radionuclide you're going to use for your application. So now we've seen about how you use that for imaging. But I was talking about treatment. How can you switch from imaging to therapy? The idea of therapy is to actually go and destroy a cell that you do not want in the body. For example, a cancer cell. So if you have found an agent, and by that I mean a targeting system, that goes to your cancer cells, which you can check with the, M with the imaging by using a gamma ray emitting radionuclide, then you know it's going to work. And therefore, you can just change that radionuclide to another one, which will be an ionizing particle. And this is something you, have, you must have seen in this master class, that when um, uh, an alpha or a beta particle goes through matter, it deposits its energy and therefore creates ionization tracks. Now, here you have the ionization tracks represented by those little dots for a beta particle in blue and for alpha particles in red. And you can see that where it causes ionization, superimposed in scale with the DNA, that an alpha particle can create a lot of break in a DNA strand. And that will result in double DNA strand breaks, which the body cannot repair. So that cell will just have one option, it is to die. And that way, when we irradiate with those alpha or beta particles, we can actually destroy the cells that we are targeting. The beta particles penetrate to about millimeter. You see here, this is how it goes. It can go through paper, but not quite through aluminum or water. And that's why it can irradiate a full tumor if it's quite big. But if you have also little cancer cells spread everywhere in the body and not just as a big tumor, you can also use alpha particles because those will have only nanometers of penetration, which is a few cell steps. If you have gamma rays emitted at the same time, you can also map how this activity, how this action is going. So those are the basics of the um, uh, of the nuclear medicine. And again, we have to match the half-life of our radionuclide to the biodistribution and the speed at which it goes through the body. 
But how do we choose what's the right radionuclide? Here, I've taken the top corner of the nuclear landscape. You definitely have seen that. And now the question is, out of all of these, which one would be the right one to do alpha therapy? Well, first, it needs to have substantial alpha decay branching, so we only keep the yellow. That's an easy choice. But I've said as well, it needs to have a half-life that is appropriate. It needs to be at least a few hours so that you can produce it, manipulate it, inject it to the patients, and so on. Uh, but it cannot be more than a few days because otherwise uh, you just do not have a vector that will stay long enough in the body. So you see how most of them immediately gets removed. The next stage I've talked about is the chemistry. Now, that's a bit of a more complex picture uh, and question, so I skip it for now. And I go instead to, can we produce it? And then you see all those that are here in the top, they're all weird, super heavy elements that we just produce a handful of in very advanced labs. There is no way we can do that for patient, for routine care. So you see, there's just a very tiny amount left here at the bottom. Actually, when we zoom on this, you can see it's a few isotopes, one of uranium, one of protactinium, two of thorium, one of actinium, and two of radium. And then I looked up on this website here from the US, which one do have clinical trials? The two radium isotopes are actually quite interesting, and one we'll talk about a bit later, the Shofiko drug. Then you get interest also in actinium with eight ongoing clinical trials, okay, it's quite a few less than the 50 on radium. And on thorium, there is one on 227, and that's it. And that is everything. So actually, people only rely on those four. This is a bit of a shortcut. There are three more, much lighter in mass, that are also used, the terbium, astatine, and lead isotopes. So terbium-149, astatine-211, and lead-212. Um, and bismuth 213 in the decay chain of actinium. But nonetheless, uh, what it shows here is, although you have thousands of radionuclides, only a handful can actually be used for targeted alpha therapy. But can they? And then you look at radium. It's the most popular. And one of the reasons for that is also because it has a long tradition. If you remember your scientific history, radium is one of the first uh, radionuclide that was isolated by Marie and Pierre Curie. And then after that, people were really excited about it. They made watches that would glow in the dark with radium dials. Um, they also made, and here it's an old commercial uh, um, face cream that was guaranteed containing radium and that would take away your uh, wrinkles. Of course, it would give you cancer as well, that they forgot to say. They even had radium salt that uh, people could uh, simply take by themselves. And we know to do better today, right? So definitely, I would not recommend to um, take any of those, right? And I must here uh, absolutely tell you, this is not the way to go, right? Okay, so now that we've gone through those basics, um, let me bring you through some recent highlights of the nuclear medicine field. One success story that I want to bring forward is that of lutetium-177. It is actually uh, one of the most recent drugs to come to the market, or one of the most recent uh, radionuclide coming to the market, simply because it is one that is very versatile and with which we can really work out all that engineering that I was mentioning before. Uh, the NETA-1 trial was the first one that reached the final phase of testing on patients, uh, where you had a few hundred patients worldwide, that's what we call a phase three clinical trial, where you have patients uh, that are given this drug, some other that are given a competing drug, and then you try to see which one performs the best. And those are the very complicated plots you see here on the right. Let me guide you through them because I think they are quite revealing. Revealing. The first one is what we call a progression-free survival. It means um, here you count the number of patients for whom the tumor does not grow. 
And you see at the start, so here it's in a uh, month since the start of the trial, for the first few months, all patients are stable. Nobody's getting any growth in their cancer. So that's really good. But you see that after a few months, then many of them start to see the tumor grow without being able to control that from what we call the control group. So the, those given a competing treatment. While those who were given this lutetium uh, radiopharmaceutical, you can see that a lot more of them keep not having any growth in their tumor. When the tumor grows, it's not only that it's bad as a cancer, but it also very so sometimes it affects other body functions and it does affect a lot your quality of life. So here we can see that those patients were really doing a lot better. The other plot you have is what we call the overall survival. It means as long as the patient is alive, you stay here on this plot. And when someone passes away, then, you know, it starts going down. And you see here how after about two years, half of the patients in the control group had passed away. However, there were a lot more patients surviving in those treated with this drug. You have to realize as well, when patients are participating in those trials, it's after exhausting all the other treatments. So their cancers are very advanced. If you could already treat patients earlier with such drugs, you might even have a lot better improvement in their, in their treatment. And this is actually what is being investigated nowadays in facilities like the University Hospital of Kairi Leuven, uh, where I am based. Now, based on this lutetium dotatate, with, which is called lutateram, uh, the company AAA, when they published uh, that results in 2017, from one day to the next, their value on the stock exchange exploded and they got bought for a few billion euros by the Swiss company Novartis. So it shows that there is really a big thing going on in there. And that's just one example. I could bring you a lot of examples of five, six, seven companies, each of them being bought in a similar way. Uh, now, lutetium-177 has been quite successful. Here it is for the treatment of mid-gut cancer. Uh, but now they are also developing a drug, one that has come to the market last year for prostate cancer as well. And they are currently researching drugs for breast cancer, those being the ones that uh, affect the most patients nowadays. But can we do better than lutetium-177? And that's where research comes in. Lutetium-177 is now clinical routine. And in, on our end, we are trying to look as whether Samarium-153 might not be better. The lutetium has a half-life of six days, Samarium only two days. So you can see again how the half-life may play a trick there. Also, the type of radiation that is being emitted is very important. The problem, though, with Samarium is that we cannot produce it um, in sufficiently pure uh, quantities. So at the moment, if you put it in a nuclear reactor and you start to do neutron capture on Samarium-152, you will reach a point very quickly after a few days where you produce as much as you destroy in the reactor. And you never get more than about 2% being in the Samarium-153. And that's not enough for the very strongly acting and the very well-targeting um, radioactive pharmaceuticals, because then you will saturate the, uh, all the receptors with stable isotopes instead of having the radioactive ones that are very active. However, at CERN, we have developed a technique to bring that purity up to a much higher level. And when we do that, we can start using it as a radiopharmaceutical. And you can see here a picture of um, a mouse that was made with this samarium where we had grafted a tumor here under the shoulder. And you can, it's, you can see it clearly highlighted, as well as those are the kidney, this is the guts, and here this is the bladder uh, that are part of how it is all being processed. And we were that way being able to follow the biokinetics, see exactly where it goes, ensure that it was working with the targeting. Um, and then we were saying, okay, so we have a drug that works. We have a way of producing it. What's the next step? And the next step is clinical trials. We will actually begin our first inpatient clinical trials by producing that isotope here in Belgium, 
shipping it to CERN in Switzerland to do the separation, and then bringing it to a hospital in Germany in Heidelberg. And that will start in the next few months. So we are very excited to see those prospects. Uh, and let's hope it's going to uh, be uh, very, uh, very efficient. But OK, I've said we can separate it. How does that work? Now it's my chance to bring you a bit of physics beyond the, the medical cool stuff. So mass separation. Here is an animation of how we do that at CERN. We first bring in radioactivity into our uh, target container, either by doing reactions, as is being presented here, or by irradiating in a reactor and then bringing it into that target container. You have to realize this is only about 20 centimeter long. Then you heat it up so that the material gets released and brought into an iron source, where it is turned into a positive iron. This entire contraption, about 30 centimeter in diameter, is held on a high voltage platform at 30 to 60 kilovolts, and that pushes the ions out and creates a beam. That beam is then sent through the homogeneous magnetic field of a dipole magnet, where it gets separated according to the mass over charge ratio. And because the charge is one, it's a mass separator. Now, what is the physics behind that? How does that work? Let me show it to you here. We create a monoenergetic beam. So it only has one energy. It's in that range, but it's either 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. Like we just choose one and that's what we accelerate. And then you have to think, you know, what does it mean energy? It means kinetic energy. And you all have seen in your lectures, E equal one half mv squared. That relationship traumatized me in high school, so I can only imagine what you must be thinking now. But it's very cool because if E does not change, if the energy is constant, then if you get a different mass, say mass 152 and mass 153, you need to compensate by having different velocities. So the 153 will be going slower than the 152. And then when it comes into the magnetic field, it will not be bent with the same strength because in this magnetic field, and now you need to put your fingers like this in the air, twist your wrist as you do with the Lorentz force. And you remember that the Lorentz force is the charge, but it's the velocity times the uh, magnetic field. Your magnetic field is constant, your charge is one. So the only thing that changes is your velocity, which is then related through this equation here to your mass. And that way at the end, you get that the light masses get pulled a lot more and the heavy masses a lot less. And after the magnet, they end up with being spread along a line. We define here a quality factor parameter. We call it the mass resolving power. And typically it ranges between 500 to 20,000 depending on, on the device, but it's always enough to at least separate the two masses of interest. We apply that technique at CERN in two facilities, Isolde, um, which is more for the fundamental research, the kind of place Christian and I would be doing our fundamental experiments. And here you see, for example, the driver proton beam coming at this place, the target that was shown. And here you can see the bending magnet that actually separates the beam. But we can also do an offline separation with here an second machine where we bring, for example, the radioisotopes uh, that are produced in the nuclear reactor, and that's the medicis facility that we use solely for purifying medical radionuclides. Okay, but back to our highlights. I mentioned before the radium, and one drug that is currently on the market today is Xofigo. And it's actually just radium salt. In the end, exactly the same stuff I showed you before, and I said, do not use. Because radium is a chemical equivalent of calcium. And I mentioned it before, calcium goes to the bones. But when you get bone cancer, it's a bit dumb. It does not understand the difference between calcium and radium. For it, it's just a uh, fat calcium. And so it will just take it as well as it does the calcium. Now, why do we do that? For uh, bone cancer, it's because inside the bone, you've got a bone marrow, and that's where a lot of cells for your body are being produced. If you irradiate that with a beta particle, it will penetrate through the bone 
and irradiate the marrow and make you very sick. However, an alpha particle that has only a very short track will never penetrate deep enough to reach the marrow. And that's, that was the idea behind this drug. And when this test was done, here you see the overall survival, what I've mentioned before, and you see how the green curve was ahead of the blue curve. It was just a few months. It was like three months more. And the Food and Drug Administration in the USA immediately said, you go for it. That was about 10, 10 years ago. And now it is a standard of care. Um, but besides just the extra few months you get to live, the quality of your life during those, last, those extra years under treatment are very different. You are not getting sick from the chemotherapy, uh, but also the cancer doesn't grow as fast. And that way you can actually keep living a good life. Um, however, it is the only alpha imaging um, drug on the market because those are so potent, so dangerous, they are very difficult. But I mentioned a few that were under clinical trials. So here, let me highlight what actinium-225 can do. Actinium-225 is quite a special isotope. You can see it here, and this represents the decay chain, first from some parent nuclei that populated, but here, when it decays with this half-life of about 10 days, it creates francium-221 with a half-life below five minutes then astatine 217 with a half-life of a few milliseconds, bitmet 213 with a 45-minute half-life, which itself either decays to a microsecond-lift polonium or by alpha emission to a two-minute-lift thallium. The conclusion of that is one, two, three, four alpha decays with very short half-lives between them. Now, it's not one alpha particle you're sending there. It is four of them. And you're really increasing the damage, not linearly times four, but a lot more than that. It does amplify, and that means it's a very tip drag. The other thing you can do is use this one as sort of a generator. If you remember like the, uh, the decay rates that you've seen and how things decay, they start to grow and then they stabilize and they equilibrate. Within a few hours, you actually have a steady production of bismuth 213. If you radiochemically separate it, you can make a very fast acting drug that will give you a guaranteed alpha particle. Remember when I said those peptides, they've got, say, about an hour distribution time in the body? Well, look, you have a 45 minute alpha emitter to match it with. And that way, you can see that with the actinium 225 or the bismuth, you have the ability to actually uh, target a lot of different things. And those can also be paired with gallium or lanthanum for the imaging to validate that your molecule is working. Now, let me see, ah, I've taken away the animation, sorry. So here, from this picture you see on the top left, it is a patient that was um, affected with prostate cancer and was given only a few months to live about six months to live. And you can see all those black spots here. It is imaging with gallium 68, and it shows that, oh, you have cancer everywhere in the body. They were given the lutetium-made uh, drug, lutetium PSMA, the one for prostate cancer I was mentioning earlier today. And you see how the cancer got worse. That patient was beyond treatment with a beta amazon. And then it was three months later, and they were told now, well, sorry, you only have three months to live. And five patients were offered the opportunity to try the actinium drug. You cannot do that anywhere in the world. But in Germany, it is actually possible if every option has been exhausted, then the um, their equivalent of the NHS will say, we are willing to pay you for an experimental treatment. And they were given two injections of actinium PSMA. And then you see how almost everything has disappeared. And after a third injection, there was nothing left but the bladder and the kidneys. And that's what you would expect from the drug they used. And those patients actually lived for years after the treatment was ended. Um, and they were pretty old, all of them, so a few have died since then, but of different causes. What the story doesn't quite tell you is that it also affects the salivary glands and those people, because of that, completely lost their sense of taste. One of them even said, I wish I had died rather than live and not be able to taste food. 
Um, it's a very difficult and a very personal thing to reflect on. But it's very important to know and realize that it is a multi-parameter problem. And maybe sometimes you get collateral damage. So it is still not a panacea. However, due to the interest in that, many companies today are investing into the production of actinium in Europe and in North America. So for the last few minutes, what is the nuclear physics contribution to that? Because I'm telling a very cool story, but I'm a nuclear physicist and Christian as well. What are we doing to, you know, contribute to that whole story? And what have you learned that uh, in this masterclass that could be valuable for this? Well, the first thing that I want to bring up is nuclear data. And what do we mean by that? Well, half-lives, that's nuclear data. Reaction cross-sections, that's nuclear data. And those are very important. So I've mentioned before, you know, how you need to make sure the half-life is well-tuned to your molecule. But that you can go say, bah, it's days, it's, out, it's about good. It's hours, it's about good. But that's not enough. When you actually produce those, you, have, you produce them in one place, then you bring them somewhere else, then you manipulate them. It takes time. During that time, it decays. Now, imagine I tell you I'm shipping to you 20 megabec rails of, um, of terbium-149. And a half-life later, you receive it, and you count it, and you say, but I only got nine. One half-life, I should have the half. So I should have 10. Where is that megabec rail disappeared? Is it lost in transport? Is it maybe still in the truck? I mean, that would be a big problem. Did we contaminate somewhere? And actually, very often, the answer is no. But the half-life is not known well enough. And so you think it was a half-life, but it was a bit more. And then you have what we call a paper loss. It's just a calculation loss. But that can trigger a radiological incident. Now, you don't want that. Let me tell you, the paperwork is a nightmare. But also, you want to make sure that when you inject something into a patient, you know how long it's going to stay in their body and how much it's going to irradiate them. And for that, you need to know the half-life quite precisely. So that's why now we are partnering with metrology institutes, such as the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington, um, near Surrey, where we try to measure those half-life very accurately and precisely so that we are able to tell really how it should be done. One good example here is terbium-161. It's a beta emitter that behaves a bit like lutetium-177. And you can see here all the different measurements that have been done at different times. And in red, that's the accepted value until the work that was done here within the IRMA and PRISMAP collaborations between CERN, KU Leuven, and NPL. And you see how all the measurements that we have done and that were recently reported are completely off from this red accepted line. And that matters a lot. It might not be much between 6.9 and 6.95 days, but it does matter. And we've done the same also with another imaging terbium um, that has a half-life also of a few days. And you can see how you can play along with those two, one for imaging, one for treatment. Then I've mentioned also about cross-sections. Uh, reaction cross-sections a bit more complicated to discuss, but just to tell you that we are also looking at discrepancies. And you can see here how you've got those points that are high up and those, po those points that are below with a, almost a factor two between them. Well, for the industry, a factor two in production makes a big deal in whether it's commercially rentable or not. So those are all the sort of information that we have together. Also with the mass separation, as I've mentioned before, Actinium-225 is super interesting. Actinium-227, not so much. It's got a long half-life, um, and, and you always produce it together with the 225, but then your hospital would create so much waste by having the 227 that it makes it impossible to use. In North America, where they have big spaces, they can just really sit in the nature, and that's fine. In Europe, we are so densely populated, we do not have the ability to release that. We have to keep it. And better to separate it before rather than create a lot of nuclear waste in the hospital. 
And actually, in the research led by my PhD student, Jake Johnson, um, we actually managed to realize that separation. And we are now thinking of going to clinical trial with uh, the mass separated actinium. Also in the nuclear data, if you remember this big chain, you have many isotopes. And technically, you could use any of the decays to check how much you have at the start. We know the math. That's easy. Except that when we compare all of that, you can see you don't need to see the details, but just that we have a lot of different ways of doing it. The data did not agree. Again, one of those big paper loss. That has to do in part with the half-life. You see here, that's the half-life that has been measured now. It's not about 10 days. It's 9.9179 days. But also, we need to do a lot more decay spectroscopy on those isotopes. And here you can see the um, Isolde decay station uh, that will be used to do that study. And that's the study that Christian and I will be performing together in the course of the coming year. So can we do more for research? And our time is running out. So I will do my best to um, bring you through the key points that I want to, to say here. And it is that if you do something on your own, it's great. But if you do it together, then it's a lot better. And I've mentioned before how CERN, Love, and NPL are collaborating together, how Christian and I are working together on others. But then we formalized that in a European program called PRISMAP where we bring nuclear labs together, like CERN, for example, like the ILL nuclear reactor in France or the SCK-CEN center that also has a nuclear reactor, but also biomedical research center, such as uh, the nuclear medicine here in Munich, or even metrology institutes like NPL. And by pulling our resources and our capabilities together, we hope to really bring that forward by covering everything from the backbone preparations to the irradiation themselves with different types of accelerators, alpha, protons, neutrons, by doing physical separation at CERN or radiochemistry to separate the products from each other, radio labeling research and quality control assessment all the way into um, in vitro and in vivo studies, shipping and logistics, you name it. And we take all of that under our wing. We have a rather wide portfolio, and you can see here some usual suspects, actinium, samarium, the terbiums, and the acetine I've mentioned before, the bismuth, and so on and so forth. Um, we already have quite a lot of projects that are accepted here. We are supplying to 32 different projects all across Europe. And we actually even have one that has already published their first results. Uh, at the end of last year, where they compare the well-known lutetium-177 I mentioned with this novel terbium-161 uh, for which I've shown some of our research. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that nuclear medicine is a very promising treatment modality for cancers and um, that it both improves the survival of the patient, but also their quality of life. By tailoring the treatment the patients need, we uh, need to broaden our offer in medical radionuclides and try to go beyond the usual suspects. But that adds a lot of new nuclear physics research and pipeline and supply chain to sustain that. Radioactive beam facilities like CERN have the ability to empower this research. And now we are even doing mass separations and a lot of new facilities are currently on the books to realize that dream. At the European level, we have PRISMAP that has federated many partners, and the European Commission is actually at the moment talking about uh, furthering our program, at least to the horizon 2030. So I thank you very much for your attention. I thank also my funding agencies who have enabled this work. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. And I can see that uh, our participants are joining me in in thanking you. Um, so uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, we've we've got a lot of questions come in already, um, but just for participants now, uh, do feel free to, to keep asking questions um, while we're talking now. Uh, I'll keep an eye out on the, um, on the questions as well, and I will keep up with it as much as I can, um, as well as I can. Okay. Um, 
just just to get started a little bit um, on that. So you talked a little bit about different survival rates, and I got a number of questions where uh, that that are about how those treatments affect the survival rate. So so can you can you elaborate a little bit on what types of treatments or what specific treatments um, do you think have the best survival rate demonstrated or potential for it? Um, it's, it's quite challenging because no two patients are the same. No two cancers are the same. So what is very important is making sure that you find the right treatment for your needs and that each patient is given a, a treatment that is appropriate to them. And that's why this imaging aspect is very important because you first check is that drug actually going to work on that patient? And only if you get that confirmation, then you go to the treatment. Otherwise, you start to see maybe not that one, maybe another, or maybe another. Whereas there are more global ways of doing the treatment and that are just broadly acting, but do a lot more collateral damage and a lot less control. So if you've got something that you're reacting to, fantastic, you should go for that. Otherwise, you have to compromise in a way. One thing that's quite important to realize as well, the nuclear medicine, it comes at the very end when the cancer has spread through the body. If you have a cancer that is very localized in the starting stage, surgery is still going to be the best thing, right? because you take the entire cancer away, there is no cancer left. So it is also part of a full treatment planning that a patient has undergone successively. So that's also something that's important to realize. Okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of, of side effects, you, you mentioned that a little bit. So what are the, what are the different side or well, sort of how is it that these treatments are being optimized in order to reduce the side effects or are there are there better ways looking forward of of reducing the side effects so um it's again the same point if you've got a drug that's very broadly acting it's gonna affect everything positively or negatively so that's when, for example, in chemotherapy, you're going to have a lot of secondary effects. However, if you get a drug that's very specific, very targeting, it will only affect what it targets. And that's the strength of the nuclear medicine. If you were to attach a radionuclide to a um, very broadly acting molecule, it would simply kill that patient, right? It is so much more potent. So that's why you need to make sure that it works well. Now, in terms of how it affects the patient, um, I was very fortunate in, um, in the last few weeks to be at an event in Brussels where a patient who has undergone such therapy came to talk to us. And he said, um, on the day he gets the injection, he feels a bit sick. I've shown, you know, it goes to the kidney, it goes to the bladder. So there, it will do a bit of damage. And those, you feel them in your body. You don't know what's going on, but you feel a bit, mm. And however, after 24 hours, it's gone, it's done. And they do not feel anything anymore. Whereas a patient under chemotherapy will feel the effects for weeks. The other thing that that patient was saying is that they were so fit during their treatment that they would bike 30 kilometers from home to the hospital to receive treatment. A patient that is under chemotherapy needs to be carried in a wheelchair because they just, they are so sick, they don't even want to walk. And I think this is also something that's, um, that's very impactful in this treatment, is that the people who undergo those treatments do not feel sick while they are being treated. And that's what I mean by such an improvement in their quality of life. Okay, that's that's very good to hear. So, um, 
It's a very interesting question uh, from one of the participants about uh, what happens to the cancer cells as they spread through the body. Do they still replicate the original tissue um, and, and the effect? So can you target them in the same way that you would have targeted them when they were part of the original cancer? Or do you need a new type of targeting? It's the um, 1 billion euro question, I would say. Um, what is known is that cancer cells mutate. And there are some mutations that are very common that you will see in many of those cancers. So we know that they will start to express something different. However, not all cancers will mutate in the same way. So, um, if you take prostate cancer, for example, some will have an overexpression for what we call PSMA, whatever that means, it's just it's, just its name. And you have PSMA 647 and you have PSMA 611, and some will respond to one and not the other, depending on their mutation. But we know those are common mutations we will see again and again. And sometimes, for example, uh, all those cells will keep responding to testosterone. So there are other research groups who say, why don't we use testosterone as our targeting agent? But can it be discriminative enough between the different cells? And that's what um, the NETO-1 trial was doing. It was using somatostatin receptors. And it's a standard receptor. You have it in all your endocrine system. But the cancer cells suddenly go crazy and they start producing hundreds, a thousand times more receptors on, on their membrane. And so it will go to the cancer cells because they just have so many. So it's not a different one, but it's a different amount of receptors. So it is, again, every patient, every cancer is going to be different. And it will change in the course of the cancer evolution for the patient. Maybe one day they're not responsive to a treatment but maybe a month later than they are. So that's why you always have to be um, attentive and check the evolution. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, a slightly more sort of technical question on, on the cancer treatments. When you showed these diagrams of the patient treatment with um, actinium, uh, and you mentioned that the bladder and kidneys were still lighting up um, after that, uh, was that still a cancer in the bladder and kidneys, or was that a different effect? No, it is indeed a different effect. Um, so what happens is I've shown you know this construct, this radio pharmaceutical, mm -hmm. and it is a foreign particle. It is a foreign molecule in the body. So the body will clean it up. And the way it does that is by bringing it to either the liver or the kidney where it gets broken down in different parts, and then all those parts get thrown through the bladder to be excreted from the body. And that's why those different parts of the body will light up. But this is also why you tend to get sick in the first part of the treatment, because those organs then get exposed to the radiation. So sometimes part of the engineering is to try to find a way to bypass the kidney and go straight to the bladder or to even prevent it from going to the kidney and make sure that it keeps circulating in the body and so on. So it is really part of all the, um, the body biochemistry and, and bioengineering that is required in the development of those radiopharmaceuticals. Okay, thank you. So, so you've already, so now you just touched a little bit on how the body gets rid of, of it as waste, but, but more broadly, when you produce these radioactive elements, if it doesn't do the job, or if you if you t it turns out you can't use it for what you'd intended to use it for, and you need to get rid of it, how do you dispose of it? So the the nice thing, if I can say that with those isotopes, is that they are short lived by waste standards. The longest lived is actinium two two five with a half life of ten days. So you just wait a month or two, and then it's all gone. Right. So that's the advantage of it. However, what is true, and what I've mentioned, is the co-production, for example, of actinium-227 
and its half-life is 22 years. You cannot wait five half-lives because that's a century. So then you have indeed a problem. Now, there are different ways we are trying to, to look at that. As I've mentioned, if we can separate it before, then we handle it with the standard radioactive waste treatment in our nuclear uh, facilities, in our nuclear infrastructures, where we have the right facilities, where we have the licenses, where we have the partnership with the different companies that handle those things. In the hospital, they actually need to have special toilets that the patients who get injected with um, radiopharmaceuticals have to use, and they can only use those toilets so that we can collect all the radioactivity and let it decay. I even saw the development of um, a filtering toilet that would separate then and only keep the radioactive material and concentrate it to reduce the volume of waste. Unfortunately for them, um, it, if, they, if they had kept it diluted, they could have eventually released it because they concentrated it then it was deemed to be long-term uh, radioactive waste. So it cost them a lot more than what they thought they were gaining. Uh, but that's then a, a legislation issue that needs to be um, explored a bit more thoroughly. Okay, um, thank you. So uh, there are also quite a lot of questions in relation to uh, the sort of future aspects. What, what do you think, how do you see the future of nuclear medicine is it going to be a more dominant part of the of cancer treatments in the future or do you think it's on its way out or how do you think it's going to develop over the coming um decades while while we're working and and actually while the next generation of of scientists are taking over from us yeah so um there are a lot of different groups that have looked into such projections so I want to first bring their, their views rather than my personal gut feeling. Their insight is that therapy will take over. So I would say in the last 50 years, besides thyroid cancer, there were very few therapies. It was mostly imaging, brain activity, or that sort of things. Um, but in the last few years, we've seen in the last decade, I would say, we have seen the release of a lot of different new drugs, Xofigo, Lutatera, uh, things that get sold for billions of euros. And they expect this growth to be uh, tenfold in the coming 10 to 20 years. So really, uh, there will be an explosion in therapy that will be accompanied with the need for imaging, because you cannot do therapy without validating it with imaging. So that will also grow together with the therapy. So the market will definitely grow. What does it mean, however, in terms of research or in terms of concrete use? And then that's my personal take. Diversification is what is needed. You cannot treat everybody with lutetium. The same way you should not treat everybody with chemo. The idea there is that we're going to need to have the different isotopes, the samarium, the terbium, the lutetium, the alpha emitters, radium, actinium, astatine, and really try to, uh, to develop all of those in parallel so that you can always use the right one for the right patient. The problem in that picture of diversification is the supply chain. Because right now, lutetium has a very clear supply chain. Terbium-161 can sneak into that supply chain and work the same way. The others, not. So we need new accelerator facilities. We need research into the production and into the logistics. And we need, once we have done all of that, a network, a distributed network of facilities that will guarantee the supply and the reliability of that supply. Funnily enough, the European Commission is thinking the same. Uh, I'm very glad to inform you all that Yesterday, they announced a 16 million euro project for the production of Astatine 211, uh, in which the PRISMAP collaboration is participating. Um, and that means, you know, there is really this, this understanding that it will require a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of involvement and a lot of developments in the near future. 
Well, that sounds um, actually very encouraging and, and interesting. And, and obviously, this is a fantastic place for you, for me, for us to hand over to um, also invite the next generation of, of scientists to, to join in and actually make that happen. So with that, I think it's fair to, to thank you on behalf of all of our participants. And I could see that there are plenty of thanks coming up um, to you as I speak. Thank you so much, Thomas, for sharing your insights with us and your excitement about the future of this of this field of work and and the differences that it might make um, on our lives. Uh, so thank you so much. And um, for our participants, I wanted to to just mention particularly that um, for those of you on the nuclear masterclass, the webinar will be available um, to you as well on on the uh, on the website. Um, and even though this is the last webinar of the series, um, just remember on the Nuclear Masterclass that there's still a question forum. There are a lot of questions here that we weren't able to answer within our time slot. Uh, do post your questions on the on the question forum, and we can we can put them to uh, to people to answer. Um, uh, both for this webinar, but also for previous webinars and for broader range of of nuclear physics. Um, so I look forward to seeing your questions. We look forward to seeing your questions. And again, thank you so much, Thomas, for joining us. Thanks to the audience uh, for joining us. Um, I wish you all a good night. Thank you.